I'm Dan Snow. Welcome to Voices of the First World War. In the years leading up to the centenary of the war, the last of those who actually experienced it have passed away. But the Imperial War Museums and the BBC had recorded interviews with many veterans to try to capture what it was like to actually be there. This series listens to those stories. I used to have a little flask which I filled with rum and I kept it in my tunic pocket. When I got so bitterly cold um, in these open aircraft in the winter with the you know, one's moustache got frozen and a great block of ice appeared there, um, there was something to keep you going. And I used to open this little flask and just take a nip and when you're up very, very high, one little drop of alcohol and you feel as though you've been out on a binder. Absolutely glorious. The effect was immediate. And, of course, as you came down, you were as sober as a judge. Was it coloured? Uh, a brownie, co- brownie colour, yes. you know, like burnt sugar to colour, you might yes. say. Oh, yes, it was a bit of a stimulant, you see, and I might say the rum put a little bit of life into it. It was very good. And the lads used to look forward to it. It didn't matter what your cattle says, where you got your allowance of rum, you see, so we had a fairly good issue. First World War veterans remember a couple of techniques for keeping up their morale. Morale is simply an army's willingness to obey orders, fight and die. Good morale wins wars, bad morale loses them quicker than anything else. Cheerfulness was definitely aided by alcohol. Frederick Powell was an officer in the Royal Flying Corps and he was interviewed by the BBC in 1963. Every RFC squadron, the centre of the squadron, seemed to be uh, in the bar. That may offend a lot of people in these days, but it's perfectly true. And when you think of these boys with the tensions they lived through, through the day. And they came in in the evening, and their best friend was him. I I miss old George. Oh, he bought it this afternoon. Oh, heavens. Now the gloom would come into a mess, the morale would die, and the reaction immediately was, well, come on, chaps, what are you going to have? And that is the sort of spirit that kept going. And though people are against alcohol... I still think that it played a magnificent part in keeping up the morale of our troops generally. When war broke out, we were issued with a leaflet which Kitchener had done printed to remember. We were British soldiers, we were also ambassadors representing our country. Private Basil Farrer served as a stretcher bearer in the Royal Army Medical Corps on the Western Front in 1914. But I must say that in part it read very much like a parson's advice to a party of parishioners going off on a weekend binge to Paris. That I'm referring to is advice of the temptations of wine and women. Now, the ordinary soldier had neither the means or the facilities to indulge in such fantasies, not where he was going. Lance Corporal George Ashurst was stationed at Le Bizet, and he took the opportunity to visit the local estaminet, which was a sort of bar, as he told the Imperial War Museum's interviewer, Peter Hart. Oh, it was just a poor uh, cottage, you know, with a bit of a counter inside as you walked in and there's where they served the beer it wouldn't have made a sparrow drunk you know the beer would there be women there yes oh yes there were women there mm. not a lot not a lot of women would there be any goings on between no the there's no the... music or goings on much there not there if, it, if there was any in liberty i never saw it neither did many other people never saw it never did on the quiet. But when you get to Arm and Tears, what a hell of a difference. When you get in Arm and Tears boozing, oh dear me. Building morale started on the first day of training, a lot of which focused on building up a soldier's confidence. Stretcher bearer William Collins was in the Royal Army Medical Corps. 
When I joined, one of the first things that happened was that Captain Locke explained our cap badge to us. There's a Latin motto at the foot. In arduis fidelis, faithful in difficulties. That's, that's the esprit de corps. In other words, you were there to look after other people. That, that used to drum itself into me on the battlefield. I used to say, say to myself very often, boy, you've got to live up to your cap badge. No matter how afraid you are, you've got to live up to your cap badge. And it helped. Well, everyone said it would be over by Christmas, you see. Amongst professional soldiers, um, what was the general attitude at the time to the war? How did they view it and the prospects of it? I think the, the ordinary officer expected a short, quick campaign. Yes. It was amazing, really, the, the way the men, even when they realised that we were up against it, you know, we were going to have a very rough time. But they didn't lose their uh, optimism. In fact, we were, there was a rumour going round that the Russian drone is 70 miles from Berlin, you see. <laughs> that, that all helped, I suppose. Morale underpins discipline, doing what you're told. It helped if men respected and trusted their leaders, ideally maybe even liked them. Ivor Watkins, Clifford Lane and Marmaduke Walkington. Well, I suppose we had faith in those people who were leading us then. Otherwise it would have been scary. We were bound, our training made us have faith in whoever was leading us, an officer, a section leader, a sergeant or a corporal. Our officers were practically all ex-public school boys, and we had great respect for them. I think the officers regarded the men as, a, as quite a separate sort of human being, really. But I mean, it, it's obvious, you've got, to, you've got to have that, you see, because to get discipline. My platoon commander was the most marvellous fellow. He couldn't have been nicer. I began to suffer from frostbite, frostbitten feet. And he knew this, and uh, I was sticking it out as best I could. And I was sent with a message to him to his little dugout headquarters. And uh, when he saw me, he said, oh, have some of these. And he handed me some butterscotch. He said, they're very good for feet, you know. <laughs> and that was the sort of relationship, as far as I was concerned, I was a bit of a pet, I suppose, being so young. Any time or anywhere, the officers had it better than the privates and the NCOs. They had everything laid on for them, as any, we regarded that as an unnatural. An officer in the regular army would never speak to a private. Courage had a lot to do with it, because he did his job then. He wasn't afraid to go round and see his lads, you know, where many a time they were. We had a fine band of pipers, grain chaps. Well, they were the uh, things that kept you going on the march. When the pipes started up, you could sometimes you could see it after you've been out for a day's march. We've probably been out all day marching. We've probably done 20 miles with this pack on your back. And we finish up dead beat, but just about crippled. The band was started up. And so you hold your shoulders up immediately. And we finish like that, as if we we're just going out. Morale depended less on high-minded ideology and more on the trust and affection felt between young men in the same unit. Here's Edmund Blunden, an officer and later a poet and author. How did they endure it? How did they get through? Uh, the answer must be partly the old one, the fear of fear, a fear of being found afraid. I think that would run a certain distance. Another 
very great one, of course, is belief in human beings, your, uh, your colleague, and that doesn't necessarily mean he's below or above you in rank, but the one you're with, and any one day you say, uh, my job is to be at the crossroads at such and such a time with the bread, and old so-and-so will be there, he'll be expecting it, and there's going to be no letting him down. That goes a good long way. And then I think we had the idea of interest in what would come out of this extraordinary titanic fatal performance. Who would really win the gloves? I must say that I never had any feelings towards any personal enemy. For me and also for the, most of the boys, it was the enemy. Whether it was a British or a French, we didn't mind. And I think that the British thought in the same way. German trooper Miles Ranker served on the Eastern Front in 1914. As soon as we made prisoners, the feeling of enemy was gone. Then we took care of them, we looked after them, we asked them if they were thirsty. Most of them were very thirsty, because warfare makes thirsty. You are very much excited, you perspire, you have the great pains, you are afraid, everybody is shivering. The impression of war is not only the shooting and the killing, but the most terrible impression is the noise of a war, the noise of the exploding grenades, the rattling machine guns, and the aeroplanes as well, so that the nerve strain is a terrible one. But never one forgets what each man on both sides has to undergo. Maintaining morale, positivity and even happiness in these conditions is almost impossible for us to understand. Yet humans are remarkable in their ability to adapt, to cope. And one coping mechanism is humour in the face of trauma. Joe Armstrong was serving as a ration corporal in autumn 1914, carrying some food for his unit. One day, we were in reserve trenches, and an officer thought he'd give us a bit of exercise. To get to this here village where he was taking us, we had to go over a plateau. My regiment were right on the top of this plateau, which would probably about... 200 yards across, roughly, when all hell let loose. The Germans had retired to positions that they'd held in 1870 during the French War. Now you've got that. And they had all their artillery on this position. They knew the range to an inch. Now, wait a minute. Before we set off, the officer made us clean our buttons. Actually, you know, brass buttons. So in that sunshine... We must have been a, a beautiful target, mustn't we? One minute, they were laughing and singing and joking, all a lot of them, and in the twinkle of an eye, I was the only one left alive out of 400. I was the only one left alive out of 400. Dead and dying all around me. I dived into a shell hole, stopped there probably an hour, an hour and a half, two hours, I don't know, until things went quiet, and then I made my way over the top. And the ones that were survived, they said, Oh, here's old Joe. What about that blinking bacon? Now, I, I dished out the other stuff, but there was, I, I had the bacon in my pack. And, <laughs> here's old Joe. What about that blinking bacon? 